So far this series, we've covered everything in the initial testing session. What happened, were our responses to, uh, to the exercise, were the responses to the test itself, heart rate, uh, stroke volume, what's happening with our usage of oxygen, all of that. And we've also covered things like identifying training zones, finding threshold in and around where VO2 max is, what is going on. Now we're looking at comparing data, pre-test versus post-test. This was taken about 11 weeks after my initial testing session. We're looking still at my bike data leading up to my 70.3 uh, race in 2019. But now we're looking 11 weeks on after going away and doing some training, what changed and what was really good. But then also more importantly, what didn't change and why? Let's have a look at some of the data and let's get into it. Hey, welcome back to the channel. Nick here talking science of endurance and everything sports science in general. Thanks to everyone who's been subscribing to the channel and giving us great support. But if you haven't, be sure to click that red button down below. Keep growing this great community and keep supporting the channel by following along, sharing the videos, passing them on to people you think might be interested as well. Hopefully you've been enjoying this series where we have been talking through the data. and I'm going to continue it today with a little bit of discussion in and around what has happened over 11 weeks worth of training. We had our pre-test or our initial testing session about middle of the year. 11 weeks later after finally getting started on the bike, a bit of a slow start and then building into it, adding in some uh, specific training based on my needs, what then do we need to look at uh, that has changed? Are there any changes? What are the good? What are the bad? Let's get stuck into it. Before we do, head over to Instagram, go check out what I'm doing in terms of my own training. I've got a lot going up at the moment showing you exact sessions that I'm doing at NJ underscore sports science in the bottom corner here. If you are interested in checking that out or just having a look at what I'm doing day to day, work wise, what's happening day in the life of sports scientists, that type of stuff. Bit of different content over there and also some alerts about when some of these videos do go out. So go check that one out um, and then get stuck into the rest of this video. But what we are looking at today is the follow-up test. So I'm gonna bring it up on the screen here. This data is still my data, the bike test, um, looking at what happened 11 weeks after implementing some training and really 10 and a half weeks, it was sort of on the, on the edge of that there. And what I, wanna, uh, what I wanna look at today are some of the positives and negatives that came out of it. It wasn't all a perfect test. It wasn't, I didn't come back in 10 and a half, 11 weeks later and go, wow, VO2 max is significantly up. If you remember back from the early videos where I did talk about what my VO2 max was in that test at that point in time, it was 59 as a relative number. You can see that there I'm circling and it was only about 3,840. So really I've only increased my oxygen consumption in the space of 11 weeks by 100 mils of oxygen per minute absolute, which is barely if anything changed at all from a relative perspective. Still happened at the end of 270, but it was happening a little bit later into 270 um, and actually got into 300, which I didn't get into in the previous test. So that is already a positive. So I look at what, what was a negative? Well, oxygen consumption, VO2 max didn't actually go up, but it plateaued and then I was able to continue to work at 300 watts, whereas previously I couldn't get anywhere near 300 watts. So that's the type of thing that, I mean, we look with the good and the bad there, some similar responses in terms of heart rate at the top end as well. but. A lot of athletes can get caught up on the fact that, oh, my VO2 max didn't go up, therefore I didn't improve. Well, you actually did. And in this circumstance, I did. I got to 300 watts. It just wasn't maybe in the way that would be the ideal way in terms of we get better aerobically and we increase the wattage we can work at. In this circumstance, I've just increased the wattage, so it could lean into a bit of economy. It could be just I'm able to, able to push a little bit harder and tolerate a bit of that lactic acid a little bit more. Number of different factors. So without any further ado, let's like have a look at some of those individual responses the take in, transport, and utilize parts of VO2 max and how they change. And I want to start with ventilation. Remembering back, ventilation is the amount of air we breathe in per minute. And you can see in all of these, all of these graphs, the orange line is going to replicate uh, or show the pretest data. You can see on the right with the, the legend here, um, the orange line is our pretest data, the blue line is our post test. So the basically the, the, the follow up to it. And, and in this circumstance, we can see pretty similar response early on. Right? It's somewhat expected in the early stages of the test, low intensity, that we're going to be breathing pretty much the same because it's it's as already as easy as we can make it, essentially. Then the lower intense we go. In the second test, I started 120 watts because 90 watts was going to be way too easy and the test would have gone for too long. So um, it, it's the type of thing that we have a look here that I've matched all these up to equal the 120 watts from both things. So they're all lined up at the same wattage both times and time points. We can see pretty easy and pretty sort of similar through those easy intensities. As we get to the top though, interestingly enough, I wasn't breathing as much air. Yes, I got up to the same sort of point, got to about 170 liters of ventilation by the end of each test. I got to the same point, but it was happening at a later spot. So 
What does that mean? I'm actually producing the same amount of wattage or if not a slightly higher wattage and I'm breathing less. Automatically, that tells me when I'm looking at it from, a, from an analysis perspective, that tells me that I must be more effective at the transport or even utilization stages of our oxygen consumption equation, our VO2 max or our VO2, because I don't have to breathe as much to get the same bang for buck in terms of output. So that, that's a positive adaptation. They're not a massive change. You can see it's only a real slight change here. But even in some of these points, we have a look at the 15 the 15 minute mark of the test, 112 liters per minute at that point, whereas the previous time was 136. So there's a significant change in how much air, I'm, I'm what, 20, 20 or so liters of air less having to be breathed in, which is a lot less stress on the respiratory system. It requires less effort, less energy usage or fuel usage to be able to produce just basic respiration and, and breathe. You have to remember we use, we use our fuels, we use carbohydrates, we use fats, to be able to break down to create energy to produce basically our ability to breathe, let alone then muscular contraction to be able to perform. So anything we can save here is a bonus. So me not having to breathe this hard at the top end is a little bit of a bonus. And you can actually see in our in my respiratory rate as well, I might've had a slight change in terms of bit of lung elasticity through that the, the aerobic type work and just some practice up at the high intensity end from a bike perspective in this circumstance. I was fresh into cycling at, the, at that point in time at the pre-test, my post-test, 10 and a half, 11 weeks of cycling under my belt. I'm more comfortable breathing in those deep, deeper breaths. I'm not as stressed or anxious at that higher intensity on the bike because it's not starting to hurt as early. So I breathe. I don't have to breathe as often to get the same amount of air in, or if, if anything, I'm getting slightly less air in. But what it's allowing me to do is go for longer. So I must be getting better bang for buck down the line. And part of that down the line process is shown in the heart rate response. Again, pre-test in the orange, post-test in the blue. You can see here, as exercise intensity increased, heart rate followed the exact same trend. It increased linear, fairly linearly throughout. So as exercise intensity was going up, so too was heart rate. But you can see the blue line significantly lower most of the way along here. I mean, if I just pick a point, the 11 minute mark, 153 beats per minute in my post-test, whereas the previous time it was at 164. So I've dropped my heart rate by about 10 beats per minute at the same intensity. Top end, 172, whereas the previous time it was 179, seven beats per minute lower. See right down here at 120, I was at 112. By the end of the first three minutes, that's probably a good guide because I've steady state. You can see it all flatten out. Um, this sort of comes up, this blue line starts to flatten out as you're following along with my mouse there. Um, 115 beats per minute at the end of 120 watts, whereas the previous time was 130 beats per minute. So 15 beats per minute lower in my post test. Why? I've gone out, I've done more Ks on the bike, so that's enabled me to develop the size of left ventricle. We talked about that in uh, in the heart rate response, increase the size of the left ventricle, increase how forcefully it can contract. I get more what we call stroke volume, pump out more blood per beat. Therefore, I don't have to beat as frequently for the same output. So already we're starting to see ventilation a little bit lower to get a slightly higher output towards the back end of the test. My heart rate's lower. So I've got less strain on the cardiovascular system, the heart and the blood, and also less strain on the vent ventilatory responses. So my respiratory system that's going to allow me to stay a little bit calmer and, and not as anxious in, in terms of performance as well. But then also what it's going to allow me to do is be a lot more efficient and effective in, in distributing oxygen around the body when it, when I need to be doing that. And as exercise intensity goes up, I'm more more capable of doing that. So the body's not under the pump as much. It's easier to get, get that oxygen in, which is a real bonus. And that only is beneficial to an athlete if we can also use oxygen better. And that's this last one here. If we have a look at our FeO2 change, didn't see a massive change in this. We saw a change and you can see that blue line has shifted to the right. And I've spoken about this before in previous videos in this series. We want we want all these lines to drop down lower typically and or shift to the right-hand side of the graph because what it means is we're getting the same physiological response for a higher exercise output. So in this circumstance, let me pick a point here in and around this 13 minute mark, 16.3% FeO2. So remembering FeO2 is the fraction of expired oxygen, measuring the percentage of oxygen out of the air I'm breathing back out. 21% of the air that I breathe in at sea level comes in. If I'm breathing back out, say 16%, do the math, 5% of the available oxygen is being used. So if we have a look at 16% actually, which is pretty much here, where it sort of happened, 10 minute mark in that post-test, where are we looking at the pre-test? Seven and a half minute mark. So we've almost shifted everything by about three minutes here. Very close to, not quite. And that's why we see VO2 doesn't really shift up to that 300 just. Um, almost did, not quite. And that could be part, partly a little bit of error in the device, partly just a bit of fatigue in the legs from a hard training block leading into the test as well. But what we have seen is we've seen a much better change in usage of oxygen at the top end. Even at the lo lower end, it's a little bit lower. And as a general trend, this blue line is lower than the orange, which is a positive. But it's relatively similar here at those low intensities. It's more at high intensity where I got most of my, most of my improvement because I just didn't do it on the bike. I'd had... 
I, I'd done some I, I'd done some high intensity running up until that point, but I hadn't done at, at that point in time. I hadn't really done any high intensity bike in this pre test condition. After ten or so weeks, I had to focus on getting the high intensity in the bike to lift how much power I could push in my efforts, but then also lift how much my ceiling was. So my sub maximal became easier as well. And that's where we end up with a much better improvement here. So I've shifted this to the right, that blue line. You can see it's an identical trend. If, if I shifted this back, it would match that orange exactly the same. I've just delayed it out. And what that allows me to do is use a little bit more oxygen, makes working at a slightly higher wattage a little bit easier so I can sustain it for a little bit longer. So ultimately things like training zones did shift up just a little bit. Um, and particularly at the top end, I was able to I was able to push a slightly higher power output for some of my, my VO2 intervals, for example. Initially, I had to hold 255, 260. I started to get those to 280, 285 uh, for things like three minute on, three minute off. So re pretty beneficial in terms of performance. But like I said before, as much as we are, we're, we're a lot more effective in terms of use, uh, transport, transporting oxygen around the system. So breathing in wasn't as, as stressful or strenuous. The heart wasn't under the, uh, as much, I guess, duress in terms of it doesn't, didn't have to beat anywhere near as frequently to get the same output. And we are using oxygen better. It didn't translate to an overall VO2 max output because we've just kind of adjusted things around there. And what that tells me, and I can show you through blood lactate, and this is probably, I guess, a key reason as to why did why did we not have some change in VO2 max, even though our physiological responses are leaning towards, well, you should have a change. Why may we not have had that change? And this really comes down to that, that blood lactate reading, give us an indication of the anaerobic component to our energy production. You can see pre-test on the left here, post-test on the right. Basically, these lines are identical. Um, uh, these are actually swapped around, so apologies for the color swap there, but um, both these lines are basically identical. So it, it, we've got relatively unchanged blood lactate. If we do have a look at the ins and outs though, you can have a look at here, 240 watts, blood lactate was slightly higher, oops, slightly higher uh, in the post-test. Same for 210, same for 180, same for 150. Pretty much all the way along, except for the first, first stage, um, all the way along and the last stage, all these ones in the middle, we're all higher than the previous one. And that tells me that as much as I'm getting better at using oxygen and the aerobic system is developing along nicely, ventilation, heart rate, FeO2 are all tracking in the right direction. I'm not quite there and maybe need to work a little bit more on those aspects and get a little bit more adaptation to really start to see that change of, I guess, energy system contribution. Let's say, for example, uh, at 240 watts, I've got a large amount of aerobic energy pro being produced and that is the predominant producer or the, the major producer of energy. There's going to be a significant chunk of anaerobic. Let's say arbitrary numbers here, it's 65% uh, or 70% aerobic energy and 30% anaerobic energy helping me create 240 watts. Um, what, what I need to get better at is bringing that down to make that 80% aerobic and 20% anaerobic. That would drop my blood lactate significantly. The body's just relying on that anaerobic because it's used to it coming back to my background rather than being a background in endurance sport triathlon, the long slow stuff where I would have more of that aerobic distribution rather than anaerobic. I come from more repeat sprint. Uh, I, I, after this, um, the doing all this testing was at the back end of a, a football season where I'd be doing lots of short, sharp intensity type stuff out on a field, stop, start, really high intensity, sprinting, um, change in direction, all of that. I wasn't doing any long, slow, consistent stuff. So that was the biggest factor is that my body really enjoys that really anaerobic response. I'm almost genetically sort of built a bit more for that. It's very difficult to see a small change in, in all the aerobic responses was great, but it wasn't enough to overcome my body's ability to use that anaerobic energy and it was still preferentially using it. So all it took was me to go away and do another block of training, which at this point in time, I guess the, the purpose of doing testing regularly throughout the training cycle, I did this at about sort of 10, 11 weeks in, I then had another better part of eight to 10 weeks before I was racing. So it's the type of thing that I was able to go away, implement implement some of those changes, make sure I had a bit more emphasis on the aerobic capacity side of things, making sure I was getting as aerobic as possible to really blunt that anaerobic response. I didn't end up testing before the race because I just didn't, I, I didn't, I had a pretty good feel for where I was at. I didn't really want to know uh, all, the num all the numbers and, and sort of be overwhelmed by that in case they didn't come back as I thought they would. But at the same time, I didn't want to waste a training session on a test. I would rather go out and do what I needed to do pre-race. So I didn't do a test, but likely what we would have seen is those blood lactate numbers come down because I did focus a larger chunk of my time on not as high intensity to get the top end up, but more that bottom end working on how long I could sustain intensities for. Really that long slow was a big component of my training program because it's the things that I needed. Not every athlete will show these trends, 
some athletes will. I mean, these are some of the ones that we do see change, but I just want to take you through, I guess, what are some changes we can see? And it is very individual. I could go through 10 different examples of 10 different sets of data and you would see how graphs change in different ways. This is just my circumstance. So I don't think that your data is going to move exactly like I've seen here or I've shown here. It might be similar and you might have some, some certain things that look quite similar to what I've shown today. But keep in mind that everyone does adapt slightly differently and depending on the types of training you're doing, your focus, your background, your training history, all of that, that's also going to play a part in terms of where the graphs can go and how much they can move. I had a reasonably good top end in terms of my running um, already when I jumped on the bike. My VO2 probably wasn't going to change too much, but the amount of power I could produce could. So that's more in alignment with maybe an economy side of things. I'm getting more bang for buck for my oxygen consumption, produce a higher output rather than someone who has a, a zero background in any training whatsoever. They go and do 12 weeks of training and everything goes up. VO2 goes up massively and, and wattage goes up just because they've gone from zero to anything. Whereas I've kind of gone from starting reasonable base and then trying to work up off that. It's a little bit harder because I'm close to the top end of my I guess, potentially, if that makes sense. So hopefully you got a bit out of this video. As always, please leave all your questions and comments down below. Always happy to hear them and happy to answer any questions around analyzing the data, comparing it. Anything you picked up from this video as well, let me know down below. Happy to hear sort of the key takeaways that you got as well. As always, continue to share these videos, subscribe to the channel. Let's keep growing this great community and head over to Instagram as well. Very, very, very close to a thousand followers over on Instagram. Would absolutely love it if we could get there as soon as possible. Go over, click it to follow. Um, different content than what we have on YouTube. So it keeps a little bit more interesting as well. So there are some things you might be missing out on, some really cool bits of information that I post up there. Might post it on Instagram instead of posting on YouTube. So go over there so you don't miss out on anything. But as always, thanks for watching these videos. Really do appreciate the support on the channel. I'm gonna leave it there for today and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.